Welcome back to the channel, everybody. Let's get after it. Never know what's going to happen. This baby fell out of the sky and landed in our yard. It's never boring on the Welke farm. Thank God there's no horses out or it didn't hit the house. And it's still going and flashing. The spacecraft look like they found it in the water. Very nice. Okay. Ross, go ahead and pick this up on the south side, on the west side, right? I'll talk to him in a little bit. Well, that guy will be happy. Yeah, let's get on top of it. Like, Forget it, Bart. It's so bright out you can't see anything in the sky except the Fox satellite. No, Lisa. Plans came crashing to the ground. The failed launch of a balloon carrying a multi million dollar space telescope had onlookers scrambling for safety. What's making them go around? They don't make sense. Then you find out NASA owns 98% of the helium. Then you find out all these satellites that crash have balloons attached to them. Then you can deduce they actually float these satellites up with balloons. It's that simple. If all these satellites are moving 17,500 miles an hour, some are moving this way, some are moving that way, it's common sense. There's 50,000 of them. They're supposed to hit each other eventually, but none of them hit each other. Come on, guys. Wake up. And majority of all the transmissions we use for our cell phones or quote unquote satellite TV are all ground towers. They all send transmissions from the ground tower to tower, admittedly at high elevations. And of course, we have underground and undersea cables that make up 99.9% .9 of all transmission. So, where's all that jet propulsion technology and stuff? Where's all them rockets that supposedly carries all these things to the up to lower Earth orbit? Seems like they are just using balloons on them. I don't know what this is supposed to prove, other than we're being lied to about how these satellites are being put up in our in uh, orbit. But I mean, we all, all of us here know that NASA's lying to us already anyway. What happens when I die? You wake up into spirit again. Remember, you've never left. You just wake up from this dream. Kind of in the same way, I would imagine that if you have a dream at night when you're sleeping, and it seems so real. And then you wake up and you go, as real as that was, this is who I am. So when you die, as real as this seemed, oh yeah, this is who I am. I've just had this amazing dream and I'm going to learn from it. But this is me. And every level is probably like that. Oh yeah, this is who I am. So I think it's a series of aha wake ups. <laughs> into going into spirit and dying, you know, and, and certain things seem to happen similarly for a lot of people in terms of you kind of like, okay, I'm looking back at this life I had. Again, you're kind of reviewing the dream. You learn from it. You might meet other beings that have gone on before you that are happy to greet you crossing over again or waking up and like, hi, you've been asleep. Hi, <laughs> welcome back. Good morning. Um, and you have different possibilities. Time and space are way more flexible there. 
you can manifest things probably pretty quickly, almost instantaneously, uh, and make them seem very physical and very real, even though they may not be. Uh, that seems to be typical patterns people report from things like near-death experiences. Um, so, but, you know, it's, I think, kind of like waking up, because this is a dream. So all our loved ones, our soul <clears throat> groups, shall we say? Do we... You can have soul families, yeah, absolutely. Friends, families, why not? You have them here. No reason not to have them there, and they probably start there. <laughs> Since this is a dream, the soul families really are probably more there than they are here, even though they can choose to say, all right, I'll share this dream with you, and I'll have an incarnation. But in reality, the spirit is not in the body. The body is in the spirit. Because again, all you're doing when you die is, I'm expanding my focus. I'm taking the glasses off, <laughs> taking the tunnel vision away. Oh, yeah. Look at how much more there is. Look at how much more I am. I remember now. I really, really like this idea. I hope this is reality. I hope this is the way that things actually work. Uh, but I like this idea of when we die, we just wake up and we're in a different plane of existence. And uh, the idea of so families I find fascinating. The idea that maybe my wife... <clears throat> is a part of my soul family and in another life she might have been my sister and another life she might have been my father uh whoever her spirit whatever whatever form her spirit decided to, t to embody but has always been in some state in some shape or form connected to me and my current life i find that fascinating love talking about it love hearing about it hey if you're enjoying this video, I make a new one just like it every single day. It'd be awesome if you'd hit that subscribe button and come back tomorrow to join me. Cabbage Patch Babies and Orphan Trains. I've got quite a theory for you, so hear me out. Cabbage Patch Babies, that's basically, have you ever heard of a homunculus? Homunculus is like, they have figured out ways they can grow people out of the ground. Um, it's pretty disgusting, but it's a real thing. And so they figured out how to grow people in uh, basically a, in a cabbage pod. It's like the same as the pod people. And, um, but they had to convince everybody that the world was a globe, of course. So that all ties into Tartaria. They wiped out everybody. First, they taught all the elders. They tried to get them, get them to accept the fact that the earth was a globe. Some did. And I think the ones who didn't were killed. And then along with everybody in the population, and then they repopulated uh, there was the incubators and the uh, in, infinite infinitoriums infantoriums of the uh, the uh, I'm blanking out it's the uh, the world fairs the infantoriums of the world fairs and they would sell these babies um, live babies and nobody knew where they came from um, so like Jerry Seinfeld said his dad wasn't uh, one of the babies that came from the world fair uh, incubator but so they used these orphan trains from like 1850 to 1924 to like repopulate all of America with children. That's why you see pictures of children trying to operate these giant pieces of machinery that obviously are not built for people their size. They're built for adults at the least, if not something bigger than that. And uh, so once they were able to wipe out everybody who still knew the truth about the shape of the earth, they could start their new education program and... Uh, grow up a whole new America and uh, where a hundred percent of them when it began agreed the earth was a ball. In every big city in America there has been a fire that destroyed the entire city at some point in the last 150 years. Just google it. So first anyone who was a Tartarian, which is a blanket term I understand, was killed and then they tried to destroy every piece of architecture that proved what they were doing so that they could try to convince people that technology wasn't better before you came along. And then they grew a whole new society and they fed them the lies that they wanted them to believe. We are now at the point in our civilization where technology has severely outpaced the lie. So it's very easy now to figure out their earth is flat, but we're so locked into our programming that it's very difficult to question your reality. Once people do question the reality, consider the possibilities, then they can open their mind and start activating their consciousness. That's when you have the power to make a decision 
against authority if it's bad for you. I hate that this guy went off on this flat earth tangent because I feel like the video has a lot more credibility in the other stuff that he's talking about in the whole uh, population reset thing. And the only reason that I'm saying that is because they're actively trying to do that right now with the Great Reset. And it's not some theory. It's not conspiracy. It's not some guy who figured it out. It's what they're actively trying to do and actively saying that they're trying to do is to depopulate so that they can control us. The idea that they've done that once before in the past when we didn't have the technology that we have now to catch on to these things totally makes sense. Babies and in incubators, I don't know how much I buy into all that, but it definitely makes sense that they tried to do a, a global reset in the past if they're trying to do one now. When it comes to the Book of Enoch, there are three things that I guarantee you've heard before. One, it's not canonized, so it can't be scripture. Two, it's a different Enoch. And three, it was written long after the flood. Well, I'm here to demolish all three of those. Canonization is the process by which books of the Bible were discovered as authoritative. So, is this person who they say they are, and did they hear from God? Well, we can all agree that this Enoch definitely did. I mean, he walked with God so closely that God took him. He did not even need to see death. And we all know that Enoch's genealogy. It's Adam, Seth, Enoch, Cannon, Mahalalalala, Jared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, and then Noah, right? Now, if you're a naysayer, I know two things about you for sure. One, you've heard these misconceptions from someone else. And two, you've never read this. Because if you had read this, you would have seen an angel sent by God named Uriel to show him everything and a bunch of prophecies of what's to come, everything about the cosmos, and so on and so forth. Then you would see that also Enoch passed down to his son Methuselah to hand down the generations for the whole world to see. Yes, this Methuselah. And you'll see in chapter 83, his grandfather's name, Mahalalalalala. Yes, this Mahalalalalala. All jokes aside, his genealogy, his family is mentioned all through the book. So that's how I know you heard it from someone else and you haven't read this book. Now, think of who canonized it. Now that we've obviously determined that Enoch is a verified saint and the book of Enoch was obviously written by this Enoch. <laughs> The Catholic Church, the Popes, they canonize. Yes, the Catholic Church, the Popes who are at the Vatican, which pays homage to the freaking serpent, and has a telescope named Lucifer there. If you had taken the time to read this, you would understand the influence that these fallen angels have had on this world since the beginning of time, okay? And you would find that there's evil at the top of every pyramid, including the Vatican, and that's easy to see super easy to see and you would find that if they are the ones that are hiding this and they pay homage to the serpent and they don't want you to read this should i say more i cannot wait to get my hands on a copy of this i feel like there's so much in the book of enoch that refers back to canonized scripture that in and of itself and the fact that jesus refers to the book of enoch uh, and quotes it, that's enough to show me that at least Jesus thought it was canon. If it was good enough for him, it's good enough for me. I'll put it that way. Until he collapsed. NASA has got the world's largest vacuum chamber. This is the ISS training facility, they call. Uh, it is completely underwater. I'm going to ask you, why are they training here and not here? pressure underwater is the complete opposite of the vacuum of space. Uh, underwater, the pressure is extremely high and will compress or crush you with extreme force. And in a vacuum, pressure is extremely low and your craft will expand or explode with extreme force outward, the opposite direction of underwater. Why in the world would you train under conditions that are opposite those in which you will be working? Well, they tested this one time at the human subject. It was Jim LeBlanc. They put him into a spacesuit. You can see this here. Here's Jim LeBlanc. And they put him into the vacuum chamber and then they decreased the pressure, okay? And uh, yeah, that's, that was from the outside, from this little uh, vacuum chamber. It is from the 1960s around. Uh, and yeah, they uh, decreased the pressure until he collapsed. Yeah, uh, but he survived. Yeah, they, they can see that they opened the door and uh, he survived. And the doctor came in and he was stabilized. But the problem is, 
He collapsed while it was in the range of the low vacuum. So it is five levels above the pressure in outer space. Okay, and that was the first and the last time they use a human being as a test subject into a vacuum chamber. Now what happens when you put water inside a vacuum chamber like this here as a pump and uh, decrease the pressure, the water boils. So according to those points, it is impossible to put human beings as test subjects into vacuum chambers without killing them. In addition, underwater, moving around and pushing off of things will be much slower and tedious in a pool as opposed to the vacuum of space. At least if training is done in a warehouse on wires, there will be less resistance, which is at least closer to the complete lack of resistance in space. Water is the exact opposite of the vacuum. There is a great deal of resistance to movement underwater. It makes no sense to construct a full-scale model of the ISS underwater. An ISS replica could easily be constructed in a large warehouse or hangar. It would be easier to build, maintain, modify, etc. This is just silly to do underwater. The performance and integrity of a spacesuit underwater is the opposite of how it would perform and hold up in a vacuum. Training on wires at normal atmosphere would at least be closer to a vacuum than underwater. Real vacuum chamber testing would be the best, but again, training underwater makes no sense. Spacesuits, gear, tools, equipment, spare parts, and many others are all designed for use in space, in a vacuum, not underwater. Tools such as drills, wrenches, hammers, uh, bolts, quick release parts um, would all behave completely different underwater. This makes no sense to train to use these underwater. It's just for the show must go on. Have a nice day. So we can't even put somebody in space if we had the technology to get them there. Another shining example of the big lie that NASA's telling us. That doesn't make any sense why they train underwater to go out in space because if you're in a vacuum there's there is zero resistance. You're going to be able to move just as fast or even faster than you would here on earth because there's no wind resistance or anything uh, you're just in the vacuum of space so why do they move so slow whenever we see these v videos of them working outside of the iss doing repairs and whatnot why are they always so slow moving it's because they're underwater <laughs> we gotta talk about this this is a dry river in india and it revealed these stones these ancient carvings in the stones. These carvings are called lingams, and in the Hindu tradition, they are very significant to their religious practice. These are in the Shamala River, probably butchering that name, sorry. The pointy part is the lingam, the base is the yoni. You often see these with snakes around them, and sometimes even with bulls around them. Some of these are absolutely massive, and some are carved out of multi-ton, single-piece rocks. When they're inside of temples, you can often find them under these decorative ceilings. But if you find many of them in the wild, they look decapitated. So my man Praveen has done some investigating. Follow him on YouTube if you're not. A recent temple excavation revealed this. Underneath the lingam was specific metals in a specific configuration. They also found these iron spatulas that conveniently never rust. Here is what was underneath that lingam. Inside that pot is rice husk. So Praveen recreated this experiment and used a silver rod and an iron rod in the rice husk in a pot and it created electric current. Putting a bunch of these together, he could light up an LED. Now lingams are not exclusive to India. They're found all over the world, but I want to focus on Egypt. India and Egypt were close. Now these are going to make a lot more sense. If you do a quick search for the Baghdad battery, you'll see this pop up. Egypt used this for electricity. You can find this on the walls at the Dendera temple complex. The word for bull is Taurus. This comes from the Aramaic word Tor. The Taurus is the shape of energetic flow. The snakes represent vibration, most of the time from the sun. So containing the energy of the sun in a bowl is exactly the concept of a tokamak reactor in our culture. Snake charmers are magicians. They use magnets to magnetically charm the snakes. I'm telling you, India is the key. India is where it's at. You know, this makes me wonder if the ancient technology that we are all aware existed, but is being hidden from us, was actual electricity. Maybe they just had a different way of producing it and 
containing it. And that's what all these, the Baghdad battery and, and all of these snake looking weird structures and stuff are. But maybe because they built all of this stuff out of stone instead of using metal like we do today to conduct electricity, all of the the big key components that would be a dead giveaway to what they were actually using this stuff for has just slowly withered away. In 1954, Admiral Byrd quoted, Antarctica in the future would become the most important place in the world for science. Rockefeller was a big patron of Byrd's expeditions to the mm -hmm. North Pole oh, yeah. and the South Pole. Why do you think Admiral Byrd and the Rockefellers were so mm -hmm. much more interested in Antarctica, the South mm -hmm. Pole, rather than the North Pole? There is a situation that began to happen during World War II where they discovered that the Nazis had went down to Antarctica and built the base down there, New Schwabenland. They were like, wait a minute, why in the world would they go to this desolate place? What's down there that they would want to go and go through the harsh weather and risk everything, risk even their lives to be down there and build a base? So he decided to fly down there. Now, there's an incredible story that was in, in uh, Admiral Byrd's diary that was found by his kids, where he said he flew into an area that opened up at Antarctica, and he went into an area where it was lush and tropical almost. And as he got into this area, something took over his plane and these two UFO type craft, circular craft, flying saucers came and it took over his craft and it guided him in to this area where they landed. And then they took him to meet somebody that he calls in his diary, the master. I wonder if there's a way that you can get a copy of Admiral Byrd's diary. I'm sure that you can read parts of it online, but I wonder if you can get like an actual full copy of it. That's definitely something I'll be looking into. I'm convinced, and I know that there's not a lot of evidence to point toward this being like verified or validated in any way whatsoever. It's just one man that I've never met giving his word, but it's in his personal diary, and it matches up with what he said on TV uh, with his discovery during his uh, explorations in Antarctica. And the guy was an admiral. Uh, he wasn't just some looney tune who happened to be in the right place at the right time and had a story to tell. Uh, he was a guy with a reputation to defend. And he told a fantastical story because he didn't know, in my opinion, that the government was going to want to try to hide that and call him a liar for the rest of his life. We are being invaded, except they've always been here. Look at this. This is the jellyfish alien. Look at that face. That's a gray. I'm about to show you a video where they enhanced the jellyfish video to find this gray. I had a huge, huge revelation a few minutes ago. So everyone's been saying the Spirit of God's been telling them to anoint their houses, right? Well, I had a whole bunch of premonitions that this year, 2024, is going to be the year that we are invaded. Is this right here why people are anointing their houses? In the 2024 prediction and in the premonition, that was before Miami. And now on TikTok, I'm seeing all these people who are randomly, all of a sudden, all at the same time, having encounters. Real quick, I'm going to show you a clip of one guy's encounter. And what you'll find is he said the same thing that we saw with the jellyfish video. Is that it went transparent, then back to normal. Then transparent, then back to normal. Hey folks, it's John, the salt and pepper prepper. Today, I had the damnedest experience. The most unbelievable thing that could probably ever happen to someone. Most of you aren't going to believe me. I fought myself all day. Whether or not I was going to tell anybody. This morning I get up about 3 o'clock, make coffee, and go outside, take the big German Shepherd out. I go inside while she's going potty to get my coffee, and I make a cup of coffee, and I hear the dog is just going berserk. So I rush out the door to see what's going on. She can't be calm. She won't stop snarling. She stopped barking, but she wouldn't stop growling. And she was to the end of her lead staring at this tree. We live in kind of in the woods here where we're at. This very tall, shimmering figure came out from behind the oak tree about 200 feet from my house. It was very tall. All I can, all I can describe it as is a shimmer. You could see through it, but it was kind of glowing. And it was a tall figure. And I go get my wife and drag her out of bed. She's happy. She comes, and guess what? Nothing happens. You know, it's gone. Whatever it was stopped. It's gone. That's just one of many, and now I'm going to show you where the jellyfish alien was analyzed, and it showed up with that great picture. By the way, remember this movie? The Purge Election Year? Makes you think, huh? 
what the person did was they took their original video, turned into an image that did some clarifying, some sharpness, some blur removing. They did not add anything extra that was actually not already there. This is what the image would look like, all cleaned up as it is. There's a gray space. Now I put this in here because in a few videos back, we kind of put the jellyfish video to rest. In my opinion at that point, I thought that that we knew at that point what it was. I thought that it was these celebratory balloons that they have for this special celebration that really does look like it. But I've since seen this, where they cleaned up that image, and I know that the human eye wants to find patterns and faces and things, but that really does look like a face, and the proportionalized arms look like it looks like a body. And just It looks so convincing that... I feel like maybe I put it to put it to bed a little early. Yeshua, aka Jesus, was one of these students as well. Read the Gospel of the Holy Twelve. You'll find that when he disappeared from the Bible, where did he go? He went to Egypt. I've taken many people to the actual bed that he slept in, which is still there in Egypt. It's a shrine now. And he was there learning the Egyptian mysteries. And this is well known, well documented. I mean, that was an apocrypha text that was left out of the Bible. He left there and went to Tibet to learn Reiki healing and Qigong and energy healing with his hands. And came down through India, learned the mystic arts. And then the Bible picks up at the age of 32. I called my son out of Egypt. That's what the Bible says. And he mm. ends up riding it on the back of a donkey back in Jerusalem. So that's the loop that's missing out of there, 12 to 32. That chunk is missing out of, in the gospel of the Holy 12. Again, he also had the Mason knowledge. Hand-picked people would get to learn this sacred knowledge. Masons would actually encode it into structures and buildings, which is encoded all throughout the world, throughout Rome at the Vatican, all throughout Europe, all throughout areas like in Bosnia, believe it or not, where you have the Pyramid of the Sun there in the Bosnian Valley. They literally had a system in which they can identify people who they called adept initiates, people who seem to have some type of ability to perceive things at a higher level or retain knowledge at a higher level or display some type of talent, you know, or ability. And those people were literally handpicked. So listening to him talk about that Jesus was a Freemason, of course, sounds sounds sacrilegious. And I've had a lot of comments uh, here recently about Billy Carson and people asking me, why do I keep putting this guy in the videos? Uh, I, I like a lot of what he has to say, and the Bible itself tells you that you should investigate and dig into and research your own beliefs. So if you're not going to open yourself up to everything that's out there, you're guaranteed to miss out on something important. And that's why I keep putting his videos in here. If it weren't for the video recording, I would never have believed it. When the diver descended 100 meters underwater, apart from the small particles in the water, there was actually an iron pillar with a skeleton tied to it. Next to it were several wine bottles. The mystery of the underwater world surged in my mind. Even experienced divers with many years of experience were startled by this scene. As they continued to explore towards the mysterious zone, they unexpectedly found another skeleton at a corner along with a yellow square cloth and a pile of wine bottles. It seemed like a carefully arranged setup, but what was different this time was the presence of some accessories and even some bowls and dishes. No wonder when swimming here there was a feeling of yellow particles. It turned out to be emanating from this place. The mysteries of the underwater world are far greater than those of the wilderness in nature, with many unexplored mysterious areas worthy of exploration. I think this is a dive site. I don't think this is a real location of like a sunken ship or something like that with people tied to a post in it. Um, and the reason I say that is the skeletons look too clean. They look like they were set there for divers to swim down and look at. Uh, I don't think that the heads would still be attached if they were if the bodies were tied to the poles. And they wouldn't be so tightly tied to it. It would be a lot looser because they would have been tied, I would assume, while all their flesh was still attached if they had bottles of something that they were drinking there. But it looks like the bones themselves have been tied to these posts, which makes me think, all right, these bones were placed there after there were bones. So it's probably fake. That being said, that's the end of today's video. I hope you guys enjoyed the clips that I put together for y'all today. I will be back tomorrow, like I always am, with another one, and I hope you come back to join me. All that out of the way, have a great, safe, fantastic day, and I will see you tomorrow.